Let us bow for a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, that you are God who has taken care of Singapore. You have been the God that favored us. And Lord, we know that in many ways you have favored us because your people have humbled themselves and pray. And Lord, we ask, Lord, especially for this weekend prior to National Day, that Lord, you stir in your people a passion to pray, a passion to seek you for the welfare of our city. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled today's sermon, Watch and Pray for Singapore, because our National Day, um, not the celebration one, but the real National Day is coming before us in about two days' time. And it's something for us to look forward to uh, and thank God for. Uh, but I think we must always remember this, that one of the reasons why God has placed us in this island, in this season, in this time, is really so that He can raise up intercession through us. You know, the best gift that the people of God can give to their nation is prayer. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, generations of faith communities have interceded for their land, asking God for forgiveness and deliverance. The reality of living in a fallen world is society requires constant intervention. Human leaders are imperfect, making imperfect decisions for an imperfect society all the time. Christian prayer covers those gaps. Christian prayer heals our land. Christian prayer brings peace. This is why Paul exhorts the church. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, he says, The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how. For everyone you know. Pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Saviour God wants us to live. And the only way for us to accomplish this, Paul writes to Timothy, is when the people of God prays. But there is another reason why we need to intercede for our nation. The Bible tells us there is a battle that is going on in the spiritual realm. So our prayer matters. It makes a very big difference. Some of you know, I love history. It was my favorite subject in school. I like reading about the world wars. So whenever a war movie comes out, I would head out to catch it. For me, one of the worst war films was a holiday Hollywood movie made in 2001 starring Ben Affleck and Kate Beckinsale entitled Pearl Harbor. It was a horror show because the scriptwriter and the producer put together two components that are a disastrous combination, romance and war. This is like putting water and oil together or cooking a juicy piece of ribeye steak and pairing it with old cucumber and watercress double-boiled soup. It's like asking your super introverted daughter to apply for a job as a childcare teacher. I remember that show, but for all the wrong reasons. I just didn't feel that romance and war can come together. Thankfully, not all war movies are bad. So in 2017, Christopher Nolan directed a film based on a real-life wartime event entitled Dunkirk. I wonder how many of you watched this show. This film tells of some of the miraculous string of events that saved thousands of lives. If you don't know this part of history, it was on 10th May 1940 where Adolf Hitler unleashed an unprovoked attack on France and Belgium. Within days, the British army were outmaneuvered, outgunned, and outprepared. They found themselves at the beaches of Dunkirk, facing the sea and being pursued by a fast advancing enemy from land. The German high command, with confidence, declared that its troops were on the verge of destroying the British army. 
the total destruction of an entire retreating army of tens and thousands was imminent. This view was also shared by the British Army strategists. So Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Britain during the time, wanted to prepare the nation. He was preparing to announce that the nation was facing a military catastrophe involving the capture and death of more than 300,000 men. So Winston Churchill was preparing to make the announcement. But significantly, just before the announcement, the King of England, George VI, requested a national day of prayer. A national day of prayer. He asked the nation to go on his knees and to plead to God for mercy, for intervention. On that day, the nation devoted itself to prayer in an unprecedented way. Eyewitnesses and photographs saw overflowing congregations in places of worship all across Britain. Long queues formed outside cathedrals and tiny churches alike. The same day, an urgent request went out for boats, any boats that can make the crossing between the south of England and the north of France. The military had made a decision to evacuate as many troops marooned in Dunkirk as possible. It coincided in that time where the nation came together to pray. There was a ground-up swell of volunteers, of prayerful people, but also ordinary fishermen, boat captains, who answered that call to snatch their boys from the jaws of certain deaths. Boats of all shapes and sizes were mobilised around 800 civilian vessels in all. My friends, curious things happen when the people of God pray. Curious things happen when the people of God humble themselves to intercede. Apart from innovation, hope and stirred hearts, there are also unimaginable irrational events that takes place when the people of God plead. In a decision, and this is found in history, that infuriated his generals and still baffles historians, Hitler ordered his army to stop advancing towards Dunkirk. Had they continued, the annihilation of the British forces would have been inevitable and the war would have taken a different, darker and more destructive path. But for three whole days, the German tanks and their soldiers stood idle while the evacuation unfolded. On top of that, there was bad weather that grounded the German air force, allowing the Allied soldiers to march unhindered from the beaches to the boats. And over 338,000 troops were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk and returned to England. Many not in sophisticated warships, but simple pleasure crafts and fishing boats. This is what many call the miracle of Dunkirk, the miracle of the deliverance. And it was all over the British news, the miracle of deliverance, the miracle of Dunkirk. My friends, when a nation prays, divine coincidences take place. People in slumber, awaken in intercession, can halt overwhelming enemies and save lives. Let me quote Canon J. John. Some of you know he's been in Singapore years ago, even preached at our Festival of Praise. This was Canon J. John's reflection on Dunkirk. And as a 21st century Christian pastor in England, he wrote, Indeed, I think Dunkirk stands as extraordinary encouragement to pray in faith. However great our problems, God is greater than them all. That Dunkirk encouragement to pray in times of need applies at every level of life and to every challenge, from what may be a petty domestic crisis to a national disaster. 
And although our nation may not face imminent military catastrophe on the scale that it did in 1940, you don't have to look hard to see major and overwhelming problems. Dunkirk may have been a military epic that should be remembered, but far more importantly, it's an encouragement to pray. And I like that. He goes on to write, the events of Dunkirk might make us want to reconsider the elimination of God as an actor from history and politics. Friends, do you remember the old statement in the CR Century and Marlon Road, for those of you who were there? It says, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. What a powerful truth. When we work, we work. But when we pray, when we humble ourselves, when we intercede, God works. Praying for our nation is one of the greatest gifts that we can give to Singapore. It is a divine purpose that moves God. Someone said prayer moves the hand of omnipotence. Prayer moves the hand of the all-powerful one. It is where we tap onto God's power. It is the recipe for miracles. The bugle call for the Father to act. The posture of humility that Jesus honours and the channel where the Spirit thrives. No wonder Satan hates it when Christians watch and pray. The devil will do whatever he can to prevent us from prayer. And so, to the Psalm of Ascent, Psalms 130, read for us earlier on, we find here, built into Jewish spirituality, established by David and Solomon, the call for the people of God to pray for their nation. So this is what we find in the psalm that was chosen for us. That there was a stir, there was an inbuilt imperative in the Jewish spirituality to pray for their nation. This was not something that was optional for the Hebrew race, but it was an imperative. Have you ever thought of praying for Singapore as a Christian necessity? If not, do so. See it as your national service or your national duty to keep Singapore in prayer. Read the news, yes, by all means. Forward those stories, yes, by all means. But mobilize prayer as well. You see, the Songs of Ascent is a hidden, a heading rather, given to 15 Psalms ranging from Psalms 120 to Psalms 134, that was associated collectively with going up. Why going up? Because the Hebrew people would use these Psalms to praise and pray to Yahweh as they ascended towards Jerusalem, which was built on a mount. Four of these songs are attributed to David, one to Solomon, and the rest are unattributed. Two theories regarding the original use of these songs are Number one, the Mishnah draws a parallel between the 15 songs of essence and the 15 steps that lead or led from the court of the women to the court of Israel in the temple, specifically during the Feast of the Tabernacle. So the, one of the earliest writings of Hebrew tradition, the Mishnah, speaks about the Hebrew people using this psalm as they step towards the temple of God. The second point, or the second example, was these songs of ascents may have been used in the context of pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. So the verb go up is used specifically in Psalms 1 2 to verse 4, in this sense, ascending to Jerusalem. But no matter where it was used, one thing that was very sure the people prayed for their nation regularly. Every pilgrim heading up to Jerusalem towards the temple, will be singing these songs of intercession, these songs of prayer. When they go up with the songs of ascents on their lips, they pleaded for their nation. They asked God's forgiveness. They pleaded to Him for His favour. And that is why we read in Psalms 130, in verse 1, a cry to God for mercy. A cry to God for mercy for their land. And then in verse 2 to 4, it was a cry to God for a fear of Him in order to seek corporate and national forgiveness. So the people did not say, this is the sin of that nation. 
but this is my sin, the sin of my nation. And it was the fear of God that compelled them to pray that way. It was a cry to wait in hope like a watchman for the dawn of divine deliverance. It was a cry for their nation to always hope in God, to never give up, no matter what happens, to never give up, to be taunted by their enemies, overcome by circumstances, never give up. And they will be praying these prayers of intercession as they walk towards Jerusalem and they'll be crying to God, God, help our people not to give up. Help our people not to give in. And then there will be a cry of faith that with the Lord there is steadfast love and with Him is plentiful redemption. So my friends, you see here, the Hebrews had worked into their spirituality intercession for their nation. Every pilgrim knew the importance of prayer and the privilege of standing in the gap for their land. Every one of them. It was a built-in capacity in their spirituality that they had to pray for their nation. They had to plead to God for mercy, for forgiveness, for redemption, and for deliverance. My friends, this call remains true for you and I. This call remains true for the people of God, especially for us who have been engrafted into the vine. This call is for you and me. My friends, when we pray for our nation, like many of you were doing from the ground up these 40 days, we not only presented the best gift we possibly can, for Singapore, we also got to know God intimately. It is like what Charles Spurgeon wrote. He said, True prayer is neither a mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction when the Creator, with the Creator of heaven and earth. Basically, Spurgeon was saying, when the people of God prayed, they were not just pleading to God, they were also knowing God in a far greater capacity. That He is not just my God, but He is the God of the nation. So when the people prayed the songs of essence, they knew God not only as their intimate Abba, but the God of of Israel, the God of the nations. In prayer, we interact with God for personal issues. And that's right. The Lord calls us to bring our petitions and supplications to Him in exchange for His peace that surpasses all understanding. But as intercessors, we are also called to pray for others and their needs. To bring that to the throne of grace. But we I also called to bring our nation and national calamities to the Trinitarian Council of the Divine and to plead. What a privilege, what a calling to be intercessors, making spiritual transaction and intercession in the presence of the Father through the groans of the Spirit because He has given us the church access through Christ. That is our privilege. To make that spiritual transaction on behalf of others, intercession for our nation, Singapore, in the presence of our Father, through the groans of the Holy Spirit, because He has given us the church access through Jesus Christ. In that transaction of faith and intimacy, the ministries of God are made known. When we pray, we engage in the unseen spiritual battles. We sign up to rescue those across the channel that requires our help. When we pray for our nation, that is our dunkard moment. When we make a decision to dodge the safety of doing nothing, where we embrace the dangers of engaging the spiritual forces of evil, where through prayer we howl to safety one tormented soul at a time from the beaches of fear and hopelessness and bring them home to the refuge of God and dwelling, this is where we can say to them 
as we rescue them in our prayer, this is home, truly. Home is where we belong. And this takes place every time a saint takes up the mantle to pray. Something powerful happens when you ask the Lord's favour and intervention on Singapore. It may take perseverance and patience, but things happen. You know, the book of Daniel is very exciting. It's a book of vision. And one of the very exciting chapters that teaches us about praying for our nation comes from Daniel chapter 10. Um, do not have time to expound on it, but you go and read it for yourself. Because in Daniel chapter 10, there was such an encounter when Daniel was gripped by a vision that concerned the nations. So Daniel in this chapter had lost all his strength in prayer. Prayed so hard for his nation. And he had come to this point where he had no more words. And he was drawn into a heavenly vision at that point. He had prayed for weeks but nothing seemed to happen. He had brought his precious nation to the Lord, but nothing seemed to change. Then it was revealed to him in Daniel 10 that the moment he prayed, God had answered and he had dispatched his angel. And something very insightful and interesting takes place in this vision. It gives us a glimpse to what takes place in the spiritual realm when the people of God pray. The Bible tells us here that for 21 days, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, a demonic being, was opposing this angel, this answer to Daniel's prayer. Only when Michael the archangel arrived to help was the angel freed and Daniel received the answer from this angel. Daniel's prayer mattered. His persevering prayer made a difference. So does ours. These 40 days, when you prayed, and for some of you, when you fasted for Singapore, my friends, it should not end with National Day. Do it regularly. Make it a part of your spirituality, like the Hebrews did in their ascent. If you've not been part of the church prayer meeting, make it a priority in your cell groups in your disciple circles, in your three, two, ones, pray for Singapore. It matters because this prayer for our nation is not only a core of duty, it's a privilege because the Lord has given us the ability to stand in the gap for Singapore. And let me close with this. Very powerful words of Samuel Chadwick. And he wrote about countless ordinary folks in the Bible whose prayers mattered. He said, There is no power like that of prevailing prayers, of Abraham pleading for Sodom, Jacob wrestling in the stillness of night, Moses standing in the breach, Hannah intoxicated with sorrow, David heartbroken with remorse and grief, Jesus in sweat and blood. And to this list, from the records of the church, your personal observation and experience, and always there is a cause of passion unto blood. Such prayers prevails. It turns ordinary mortals into men of power. It brings power. It brings fire. It brings rain. It brings life. It brings God. When the people of God knows how to pray persevering prayers, it brings God's intervention. And that's why Hudson Tutson Taylor, that famous missionary in China, where there was no doors that were open when he was physically on that great land, all he did was to pray and to pray and to pray and pray for years and years and years. He prayed and interceded and hardly a handful of converts came through his ministry. But in his prayer, He said, it is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. And look at China today and the number of believers. It is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. My friends, this is God's high calling for you and I. 
to be a blessing to our nation, not just economically, but in intercession, in pleading, in crying to the Lord, in crying to the Lord for His mercy, for His power, for His presence. And whenever you and I, the people of God, humble themselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways, God says, I will come. I will heal your land. I will return my favour. I will bless Singapore. My friends, today, don't just be stirred by a message on prayer. I hope that you will take out your phones right now or your journal. Flip to where you can type a note, a note of response to today's message, a reminder. And do that in that moment, in this moment, and make a commitment, putting down there when and how you will pray regularly for Singapore. Make it a commitment to pray regularly for Singapore and for others. The best gift the people of God can give to their nation is prayer. Bless Singapore. Bless you. May the Lord stir you and I to be a blessing to this land. In a moment's time, the worship team is going to be leading us in a song of intercession for Singapore. And so after I close in prayer, we're going to invite the team to lead us in this song and I ask that you will use this song to pray for Singapore. Take that three to four minutes, pray God's blessing and favour upon this land. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us the Holy Spirit to pray through us for our nation. And Lord, we want to pray that this word that has gone forth will not just stir us for this moment, but Lord, you will begin to raise up through young and old who are hearing this message right now, a commitment to persevere in intercession for our land, for Singapore. And I pray that it will be a commitment that will transform our nation. It will be a commitment that will bring prayers and intercession that will flood the land from the ground up. It will be an intercession where young and old, children who are listening to this message, youths who are listening to this message, adults and the elderly who will be listening to this message, it will stir in them a desire to pray regularly, to stand in the gap constantly for our beloved Singapore. Starting with right now, as we offer this song of intercession to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.